Hello! In this series we're going to take a single iconic scene out of a movie or TV series and reimagine it as if it were a scene from a D&D table. The scene we're starting off with is from Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl. Specifically the scene in which Jack Sparrow Cut. meets William Turner. So if you haven't seen this movie, spoilers, and also, wow, one of the most popular series of all time. So, it's worth watching. Okay. Onwards. Enter character one. Name, Captain Jack Sparrow. A bold choice for a first level character, giving yourself the title of captain. Comes with a lot of responsibility that most first level characters wouldn't have. But the very wise choice in whoever made this character is that they didn't give Captain Jack Sparrow a ship. Well, I don't see your ship, Captain. I'm in the market, as it were. This immediately sets up the motivation for Captain Jack Sparrow, which is reclaiming his lost pirate ship, the Black Pearl. And remember, a motivated D&D character is a good D&D character. Jack Sparrow is a human swashbuckler rogue. He has extremely high charisma. He has pretty high dex, not great strength, not great intelligence, surprisingly good wisdom. Me, I'm dishonest. And a dishonest man you can always trust to be dishonest. Honestly, it's the honest ones you want to watch out for. Because you can never predict when they're going to do something incredibly stupid. Constitution is middling. It's not worth mentioning, even though I just did. For equipment, he has a pistol with a single shot, a rapier that is not made of wood, and it's been reflavored into a cutlass, because that's kind of what the world is based on. Padded armor, which is a bit of a stretch, but he has a lot of layers on, so I think it tracks. I think it's fine. And finally, a compass that doesn't point north, which is something the DM almost certainly gave to this player in order to keep the party as a whole on track whenever they kind of don't know what to do next. He's currently cuffed, but it's a smith's shop, so no need to roll in order to find a hammer and anvil, they're just lying around. But he's probably disadvantaged on the athletics check in order to break the cuffs off, so he fails. Okay, switching tactics. We're doing an intelligence check, probably an investigation, see if there's anything else in the room that will help him to break the cuffs off. And lo and behold, donkey contraption. Don't really know what this is, or if they exist in Smith's shops. Frankly, it doesn't really matter. DM was probably just helping out. Classic rogue, not great animal handling. We're just gonna brand the donkey. Move past it, move past it. And boom, we have freedom, but alas, before our character can make their escape, enter player two's character, Mr. William Turner. Also a human, also highly motivated, William Turner has one goal in life, and that is to marry the governor's daughter, Miss Elizabeth Swan. Picking a class for Will is a little bit tougher. My first reaction is to make him a fighter, because that's pretty much all he does at this stage. Who makes all these? I do. And I practice with them three hours a day. But he could also be a College of Swords bard because of all the dancing and kissing he does later. He could even be a paladin because those rough hands have such a healing touch. Yeah. Let me. I'm sorry. Blacksmith's hands, I know they're rough. I, I mean, yes, they are, but... but... Don't stop. But with the fighter being such an open-ended class and working so well with multi-classing and this only being level one, we're starting him as a fighter. I mean, we might pull a Fabian Seacaster later and just completely reclass him, but we're not there yet. The equipment that Will has is like a million swords. It's, that's kind of it. Just he, 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 just a lot of swords. They're all over the walls. They're still in the fort. They're, I'm surprised they're not on the donkey, honestly. Jack rolls for stealth against an active perception check from Will because the donkey's freaking out. Stealth check succeeds. Will knows something's up, so he rolls an investigation check to check out his forge and finds the misplaced hammer, and more importantly, the hat that he knows doesn't belong to him, and boom, Jack recognizes this, he jumps in. He uses this initial surprise round to try to uh, intimidate Will into letting him go, and we start our introductions. You're a pirate, yes I am. I hate pirates, great, I'll just fuck off then. Will says no, rolls a sleight of hand in order to try to get to the wall where there's a, a, as a four mentioned hanging sword, we roll initiative. Player launches in with a great opening line that he was probably sitting on for a long time. Do you think this wise boy? Crossing blades with a pirate. And then attacks and misses. Will's first attack also misses. You can see this as Jack jumps out of the way. The DM's doing a good job here, flavoring the misses with parries and jumps. On his next turn, Jack does a great job of using his movement speed in order to pivot around his enemy without ever leaving his melee range so that he takes an opportunity attack. And then once he's a little bit closer to the door, he takes his disengage and attempts to run for freedom. But how's your footwork? If I step here, very good. And now I step again. Ta. On 
unfortunately, because of the pivot, he only has enough movement speed to get him to the door, and now it's Will's turn. Now, Will has a couple different options here, but he goes with a very creative choice and just hucks his sword at the door. Terrible idea. Not how swords work. Not how doors work. He got a nat 20. The sword is in there and it's not coming out. Now we're introduced to how mature and experienced these players are because Jack is faced with an unarmed opponent standing in front of him with no real reason as to why not to just immediately strike him down. At this point, Will's player probably goes, hey, we're in Forge, right? And DM goes, yeah, we've said this like a million times. And then the Will player, he goes, well, I was probably wearing on a sword, right? Because it's a forge and that's my job. And then DM says, yeah, that makes a lot of logical sense. Why are you asking? And Will says, well, if I was still working on a sword, there would be a sword in the forge that would be nice and white hot. And then DM says, I have no knowledge as to why that wouldn't be the case. And he says, yes, even though this would be probably based on my extremely limited knowledge of forging swords. One of the most ruined swords you could possibly fight with, but that doesn't really matter because again, we're in the heat of the moment and I don't, like most DMs, know actually how swords are forged. Will grabs a new sword, he attacks, he misses, Jack parries it, Jack attacks, he also misses, and back and forth and back and forth. At this point you might be saying, hey, these aren't all misses, just the hits are being represented by whittling each other's stamina down, you know, ringing blades and mind, mind affected instead of actual cuts. Because that's a good way to, to, to flavor hits in, in low level characters. That could be the case, uh, but it's not. These are level one characters. It's hard to hit with them. The dice are not hot. It happens. Jack attempts to disarm Will with his shackles and because that's a rad move, he gets advantage and success. But as we've established, there's like a million swords hanging all over the walls. Will's player sacrificed all of his gold and all his other equipment in order to just have access to a bunch of swords and it's paying off. He grabs another one off the wall. Boom, we're right back at it. And here we get our first look at the environment building that the DM's done, which is a really cool part of this scene and also something that other DMs should try to replicate. Now this first environmental hazard is, is just a spinning wheel. We've already established it. It was mentioned earlier, the donkey's running in a circle and we have a bunch of stuff spinning. Creates a little bit of danger, forces movement, encourages opportunity attacks and creative thinking. We get some improvised weapon attacks, we get more role play, more introductions, the characters are building themselves, they're talking to each other so they know each other's motivations. Perhaps the reason you practice three hours a day is that you already found one and are otherwise incapable of wooing said strongest. We move to our next environmental feature with this cool balancing board, up the stakes a little bit, and Jack's player attempts another disarming move, except this time he rolls a natural one. So instead of disarming Will, Will is able to restrain him in place. Jack uses a turn to free himself, and in so doing, accidentally uses the environmental factor to launch Will up into the ceiling. Will uses the high ground and attempts to bash the brains of Jack out with a massive barrel, and he misses. Now, with Jack and Will both up in the rafters, the stakes of this fight are at its highest. The DM thinks this is dragging a little bit too long. Maybe it is around the table. We have other characters to introduce. So because of fall damage from the rafters, really any moment could end this fight. And because we're so close to the end, regardless of how much damage has or has not been done, this next hit, and it is a hit, is represented by a disarm. This time there's no swords around. The sword is, is well out of reach. This is a hit that is non-lethal, so the characters HP is low, but they're still alive, given the opportunity to submit and further the plot. But Jack's player says no, there's no reason for his character to submit at this point. He makes a last ditch effort. He flies down from the ceiling with an extremely successful athletics check or acrobatics, probably acrobatics check, and gets a successful hit with an improvised weapon, the sandbag at the side of the forge. This is probably another case where he was like, hey, I know a little bit more about forging and they always have sand to prevent fires. I'm gonna leap for that and try to blast this guy in the face. So we're just done with phrasing, right? That's not a thing anymore? He is, you know, unwilling to relent, but probably still mindful that this is not supposed to be a lethal fight. At this point, they're both low on HP. Jack draws his pistol, Will raises a hammer. There's no reason 
character speaking to relent, but neither of them want to deal the finishing blow because they know they're supposed to end up adventuring together. The DM is trying to intervene with the guards in the forge, but he's reminded that the nat 20 on the sword is, is a little bit more difficult to overcome to get these guards inside. And here's where we're introduced to our third and final character of the scene. This is Mr. John Brown, owner and sometimes operator of John Brown Smithing. Race, human. Class, barbarian. Motivations? I, I do not know. You know, I don't know. To get drunk, I guess. I think this is just a classic barbarian player. Get drunk, hit things good. Just doing my civic duty, sir. I like to imagine that Mr. Brown is played by Jake Hurwitz, but maybe that's just a dream of mine. And there's the first three characters of our party, leaving only Elizabeth and her player when they show up for the next session. They were absent this time, this is totally fine. God knows how they're gonna be introduced, these three dimwits, but the adventure begins. Thoughts? Did I miss anything? Did I class someone wrong or fudge any roles that shouldn't have been fudged? Let me know and let me know if I should do this with another one. And if not, then I guess you won't see me in the next one. And if so, you might still not.